All right, so hey everybody, uh, I'm Josh Adams, as he said. And I'm Robbie Clement. And we're both from iStub11. It's a software development consultancy out of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we do a lot of Ruby and JavaScript, and ideally we're gonna get into Erlang and Elixir going forward. Um, all right, so here's how you can find us on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, I've also linked to Elixir Sips, which is the video series that he referenced, so if you wanna learn Elixir, I do that. Uh, also, here's where you can find the code for today's talk. So just remember Erlang factory robots. Uh, anyway, today we're gonna talk about writing robots in Elixir, so let's get to it. All right, so by the end of this talk, you'll be able to build an embedded app in Elixir that controls things in the physical world and connect your app up to an Android interface. Uh, you'll feel comfortable building these sorts of applications, uh, or at least you'll have a good feel for it, and you'll have some example code that you can look at to help you get over humps. Um, also, you'll save a lot of frustration and missteps that you'd have to deal with if you were trying to figure this out alone. Uh, we ran into all the problems that you're likely to face, and uh, we overcame them and documented them. All right, so the talk has a couple of parts. The first part's really just a brain dump, um, lots of good information on the library landscape, focusing on easy wins. Uh, after that, we dig into building a project together, and we'll get a bit more complex. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into the survey so you guys can see for yourself. So first off, what is a robot? Well, a robot is a force multiplier. It lets you take a simple action and cause a cascade of more complex decisions. Lame! <laughs> We're not going to have definition slides in this talk. We're going to have robots. So let's start with Hobby Robotics. Uh, Hobby Robotics gets to take advantage of what Chris Anderson from Wired dubbed uh, the peace dividend of the smartphone wars, which I think is an awesome quote. Uh, we all know that processors and sensors, such as GPS and Bluetooth, have gotten incredibly cheap. And this quote gets to the heart of why that happened. And mass production of sensors, the phone has made Hobby Robotics really affordable. While the maker movement has made it approachable, and these are just some of the great resources available. Um, I think Meg's probably the first among them. Um, there aren't as many client libraries for various robotics tools as other languages might have. For instance, we had to write um, the libraries for the Spiro and the AR uh, tool team Linux. All right, so if the libraries aren't really there, then why is Elixir such a great choice? Well, not really any good reason. We just did it for fun. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, um, all the normal reasons, uh, concurrency, DSLs, metaprogramming, and you can have fun riding your robots, not just playing with them. So where should you start? Well, don't start with a giant project. It's really easy to get bogged down in a simple uh, hardware problem, such as resistor values. Like when should I learn Ohm's law? Right, so we just, you know, make sure to get some easy wins up front to keep yourself motivated. And we suggest that you either buy the Spiro or the AR drone and just play with them. <coughs> So this right here is a Spiro. Um, it's basically just, it's basically just a ball with a motor inside of it, and it's Bluetooth control via serial. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's really simple, and they're great for someone who just has to learn how to program. Um, they're really good for teaching kids since they keep them engaged. Um, let's see. This is our Spiro module, or the Spiro system. Uh, you can see here that we just start our client. <laughs> That's not actually happening. <laughs> All right. So that was awesome. Uh, so it was really straightforward uh, to port Tenderlove's Sphero library from Ruby to Elixir. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun to show some of it off. Uh, so the Sphero library very basically consists of a piece that knows the commands a Sphero serial protocol responds to, and a gen server that can represent uh, an actual ball connected to a given serial port and provide easy methods to issue those commands on the ball. 
So uh, Sphere Request is a module representing a given request to be sent down the serial port. Uh, we use a struct, which is based on the new Erlang maps, to represent a given request. It comprises the necessary fields to fully define the parameters for a request. And then the module contains functions that know how to turn those structs into the appropriate bit streams for the serial protocol. And then we build a gen server, it's Sphero client. Uh, you initialize it with a serial port attached to the Sphero, and then you can just send it basic commands. Uh, it'll turn those commands into their corresponding request structs, generate the bitstream, and then send the bitstream down the serial port. And then the rest of the code, th this is basically all of the code for the Sphero uh, library. Uh, the rest of it's just convenience methods for building the various commands it supports. Um, the yeah. other easy toy is the here, uh, this guy. <coughs> got a couple of video cameras attached to it. And one of these will cost you about $256 for a new one, and about one fifty for a refurb, or $146,571 Dogecoin. <laughs> um, and here's a basic example of our Exeron library. Um, it's, the module just allows you to keep all takeoffs hovering and moving forward and landing in theory. Uh, so, <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is another one of the libraries we had to build. Uh, and so for both of these, we ported from Ruby. So for this one, we chose to port Jim Wyrick's Argus Ruby Gem uh, because its design is really good. Uh, it's very object-oriented, uh, so I thought it would provide a more interesting challenge as far as porting something from Ruby to Elixir goes. Uh, so let's have a look at it. It's a bit more involved than the Sphere library was. So the core of xDrone consists of the drone server that represents a given Parrot AR drone instance. Um, so here you can see the broad layout of the drone. It just uses a UDP sender, an AT commander, and a controller, um, and kind of connects them together. The UDP sender is the part of xDrone that's responsible for actually sending UDP packets to the AR drone. And so here you can see it's just a thin veneer around gen UDP. Uh, the next piece is called the AT commander, and it's called this because the AR drone's protocol uh, looks like AT commands from like a Hayes modem, um, or Hughes modem, sorry. Uh, and so this is a server that gets ticked once every 30 milliseconds, and he sends his, his current state uh, via the UDP sender. And then the controller is just a gen server that interacts with the AT commander. So it ultimately provides a relatively nice interface for manipulating the pitch, the roll, and the yaw, uh, which is then basically delegated to from the drone server. Um, and there are more like gen servers here than I would ever use if I were building this straight up in Elixir. But this is a port from Ruby, and so basically replaced object instances with servers just to do the port. Um, anyway, so that's what we had to do to make that work. So now you've got your easy wins, assuming that you use the libraries and don't write them. Uh, and so you're still interested in, in playing with this stuff, so what's next? Um, microcontrollers. So uh, microcontrollers are essentially tiny computers. Uh, what makes them special is they're on a single board and they have GPIO. So let's talk about them. The Arduino showed up right around the same time that Make Magazine did, and uh, it had a huge impact on hobbyists, although everybody that was already doing stuff with microcontrollers gets really mad if you say that. Um, anyway, it's only a 16 megahertz device, it has no storage, no networking, and it has to be programmed in C. So now we have a whole range of options, from the BeagleBone Black to the PC Duino, which offers a 1 gigahertz chip, a gig of RAM, a Mali 400 GPU, and an Arduino-compatible pinout so you can take advantage of existing Arduino shields. Um, so both of those are really cool, but they're far more expensive and power-hungry than the almighty Raspberry Pi. So with the Raspberry Pi, you get 700 megahertz of compute, 512 megs of RAM, and networking for $35, as well as lots of GPIO you can hook into. So it hits a really sweet spot. Yeah, and the Pi has several features such as RCA video, audio, LEDs, USB, um, has LAN, AT, and all. But GPIO is the main reason we use this thing, or else it's just a really crappy computer. <laughs> <laughs> Setup is really easy. Make sure the SD card already loaded with Raspi and Linux, so it's ready to go out of the box. And you just have to compile Erlang and Elixir. Um, so getting Erlang on the Pi is, is easy enough. You Fetch resources, build, configure, and it takes a little longer. Or as they say, you can't just do one more switch. <laughs> and Elixir is the same way, uh, just 20 minutes. I mean, it's not as bad as 20 hours. But um, some things to take into consideration uh, we have limited uh, hardware full potential modulation out of the box, but we're going to show you how to get around that in just a little bit. And you also need to. 
Oh yeah, since we're on the subject of democracy, Colin, just in the last few days we uh, saw a meeting called the AAE Officers Group. And it has DPI issues as well, but it's essentially the neutral process that you said um, early in the um, For our some of our projects, we use Erlang L for DPI or access to file. And um, if you have a malicious project, to control hardware. You have serial ports you just write to, like you're pinning to a text file, and attach a Bluetooth, USB, or GPIO. Um, but this is Erlang, so why would you do anything other than use Erlang distribution to control a thing? Um, and so that's what we're pushing for, and uh, yeah, so we'll get to it. All right, so we're going to move on to the second part. Um, so we're actually going to build something neat. <laughs> All right. So we got some easy wins with the toys earlier, and we showed you how to take a microcontroller and make an LED blink, but we can do better than that. Uh, going forward, we're going to have a lot of quick code. Our goal is not going to be to provide code examples. We have the repo. If you guys want the code, you can do these projects yourself. Um, we're just going to demystify how all this works, and there's no magic. All right, so blinking an LED from Elixir was cool, but how can we get into some more direct control of robots? So typically, you might expect to provide your own serial protocol, like the Sphero or the AR drone offer. But as I mentioned, one of the Beam's big selling points is the built-in distribution. So what I really want is to be able to communicate from an Android device directly to a remote Erlang process. Um, and of course this is possible thanks to J-Interface, which ships with Erlang. So there are quite a few hurdles in the way of just running J-Interface from within Android. Uh, luckily, we vaulted all those hurdles, and we have lots of code that's useful when you find yourself wanting to do something like this. Um, the first hurdle we run into, and the biggest, is that J-Interface just doesn't work if you don't have EPMD running on the host. Um, so we read like the docs and we built this thing and we ran it and nothing crashed, but it just didn't send any messages at all. And so then we actually read the docs and realized, oh, EPMD. Um, anyway, so that means figuring out how to ship and start Erlang on an Android host. Um, so I'd love to talk about how we did this because it wasn't very clear at all going in. Uh, so our application, our Android application, had to launch the EPMD and the Erlang processes due to Android sandboxing. Um, before we could launch the processes, we have to get them onto the Android file system in a location that our, that our application has permission to do stuff with. Uh, so we're going to walk through the process really quickly. <coughs> um, I know you came to this conference looking for Java code, and so you're going to get it. <laughs> All right, so here you can see the code we attached to a couple of buttons in our app. Uh, it copies Erlang onto the file system, and it launches EPMD as well as an Erlang node. And here you can see the Android device having Erlang copied out of a zip. So we packaged a zip with the Android app, and then we have to read it out of the APK and then push it onto the Linux file system. Uh, and you have to do this once for each application that you use this method on. Um, it takes a long time, by the way, like, I don't know, on the order of seven minutes or so to copy full-on Erlang. Uh, anyway, so ultimately you just end up with an Android app that contains a button, right, that triggers some J-interface calls. And so each of these button presses is going to send a GenCast to a toggle function on a remote Gen server running on the Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> so here you can see what one of those Gen server casts looks like uh, from J-interface. So we just send a GenCast tuple, sorry, we send a tuple containing GenCast as uh, the first element of the tuple, as an atom, um, to the remote node. And then the second element is the actual message you want to send. And so we've registered the remote node as LED. And um, so anyway, to actually do this on Android, you have to request the internet permission in your Android manifest, because somehow that's the same thing as local network. Uh, so otherwise, you aren't permitted to send packets over the network interface at all. Um, anyway, now that we're sending messages, let's see what the server we're sending messages to looks like. So here, it's Elixir. We've just used xActor to build a basic gen server. Uh, this is responsible for toggling a pin. Uh, it's the same code you saw before, basically, but wrapped in a server. So our initial state's a tuple representing the state of the pin, and it starts out off. And then each toggle cast will write the new state to the GPIO pin using Erlang Ale, and then it'll update the server state. Um, all right, so next, we actually run one of these servers. We register it with the Atom LED. And with that, we've basically closed the loop. So in theory, Android can talk to uh, Elixir on the Pi now. So enough of the theory. Let's see if it works.
All right. Uh, so it worked. Um, so what's the next obvious step past a single red LED? And I think that's a single RGB LED. So let's make that happen. Um, so a problem here is uh, Erlang AOL only supports the hardware pulse with modulation. We'll get to that later. So anyway, if you wonder why we abandoned it. Uh, all right, so you can use pulse width modulation to simulate analog levels. Uh, all you're really doing is switching a pin on and off. But if an output pin is switched on for 10% of the time and it's evenly distributed, then it looks identical to like a 10% analog signal coming out of the pin. So you can use that to change intensity. Uh, later, we'll actually use pulse width modulation for what it's meant for, which is logic level stuff. But for now, we're treating it like fake analog. And on the Raspberry Pi, you only get one PWM, uh, one PWM pin, and we need at least three for our RGB project. So we use Pod Labs for library, and that gives us eight software PWM outputs. And to use Pod Labs for library, it's just echo command. So like zero percent uh, for zero percent is three. You have ten point three, zero one hundred percent, you have point three, one, and for a point percent signal, ten point three, and then zero point three. Which goes to zero. All right. So here's a really basic Elixir module representing uh, our RGB LED. So it's a normal stateless module. Um, it uses a couple of records to represent a single pin and the full RGB LED component. And then the init function generates one of those component records representing the LED. Uh, it also supports a set value function and a pi blast function. When we pi blast, if you look over here, we actually invert the value. Um, you can sort of barely see it. We have the inverted value. Um, and that's because our LED has a common cathode. And so we actually have to send like the inverse of what we want to send and then hook it up to power instead of ground, like it, anyway. Um, anyway, we then wrap that with a basic gen server and we expose this via um, Erlang distribution. And then on the Android device, we have a basic color picker. Um, there's nothing fancy here. As you change the slider, we want the LED to be updating in real time. So here's some code from the Android app. So what we do is we have a timer task that runs once, uh, or sorry, 10 times per second. And it samples the interface and then it, uh, fires a message using J interface based on the current state of the, uh, the, the app. And so here is preparing yourself to talk to a remote node. Um, so you can see we create a mailbox for ourselves and then we just ping the remote node and that sets up the, the Erlang distribution. And then here's how you can cast a message to a gen server from J interface. We talked about it a bit before, but so here we're casting four different casts. So we cast a value update for red, green, and blue, and then we cast the blast, which actually triggers the the Pi Blaster commands. Um, so a value update looks like this. It's just a tuple that, whose first atom, is, whose first element is the atom representing the color, and the second element is a float or a number representing the value. Um, and so while this is Java, it's very clear what we're doing from an Erlang perspective here. And then actually casting uh, just wraps it in another tuple. Anyway, so let's see how it works. So we have pulse width modulation control of an elixir process from Android now. So what's next? Well, this is the Raz Pi. And you can get toys just like him at thrift stores for about $2. And what was once loved by a child to be thrown away can be yours to love again, only it'll be way more awesome. So let's finish up and build an RC paint series thing. All right, so what you're going to want to do is you take a Sabertooth 2x12 RC motor controller, it costs you 65 bucks, uh, you get a Raspberry Pi, you get a 12 volt battery, you take a Sirago Wi-Fi Bluetooth dongle we talked about, you take a mutilated USB micro cable, you put it all together, and you end up with this. So, yep, that's roughly that guy. Anyway, um, so the Sabertooth is the motor controller that we use in this project. Um, so let me just explain a little bit about how its pulse width modulation works. Um, so 1500, these are microsecond pulse widths. Uh, means it's idle. Uh, 2,000 means go all the way forward, 1,000 means go all the way in reverse, and obviously there's a gradient between these, and then you have two signals, one for each motor. Um, so it's not very difficult. 
Um, here's the interface. It's just two sliders um, mapped from negative one to one. This is your standard tank steering interface controls. All right, so here's more Java code. Uh, this is very similar to before. It just generates a different cast, right? So um, this sends a cast to say update the left and the right values. Uh, anyway, you hook it all together and we end up with an Android remote control interface for a tank. So let's look at the Elixir code that uh, is gonna be running the server this guy tries to talk to. Okay, so here we've got a motor module. Uh, it represents a single motor. It takes the motor's pin when you initialize it. Uh, it supports a set speed function, so this maps the value it was given to the appropriate PWM level. So you can give him values from negative one to one, and he'll map it to that 1,000 to 15 uh, to 2,000 microsecond pulses. Um, and then mapping the value, as I said, just con consists of some pretty basic math. Here we have a tank module, so it, um, it controls two motors. It's not very hard to follow. It, creates two uh, motor data structures, wraps them in a tuple, and then delegates to motor to set the speed for each of them or to pie blast each of them. Um, so finally, you can see a quick server that we wrapped around the tank module. So this is what our J interface calls are sending messages to. So it uses a tank that we just saw as its state, and then it just delegates the update and the blast uh, functions to them. And so here's how we run it. Uh, we spin up an Erlang node running our IEX console. Uh, we launch the tank server. We give it pins 23 and 24, which is obviously what we've hooked up the motors to. Um, and then we register it as a raspy tank. And so here, with the code you saw, we have a remote controllable tank running on a Raspberry Pi written in Elixir. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you a demo of it. And I just wanna mention that um, after we had a repair on the tank, and one of the motors was wired up backwards, so instead of getting a, we didn't have a screwdriver to fix it, so instead of changing it by rewiring it, we just changed some of the code. Yeah. Oops. No. no. Oh my God, he actually died. Ha! No, no. no, no. I think my Android node, my Erlang node went away in Android. Hold on. Woohoo! Maybe, maybe not. Oh no, he just fell off the network. Oh. All right then. Well, we can show him yeah, driving we'll, in a video. Yeah, that's kind of miserable. We'll show it to you later anyway. We'll hook him up after we get done. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is for Rom. Anyway, so thanks for being attentive. Uh, this mostly wraps it up, although we will hook it up and show you at driving. Um, and as a, as a generous thanks for attending our talk, uh, iStub 11 provided free iPads under everyone's seats. <laughs> no one ever looks. He looked. Did he look? He looked. <laughs> All right. So this is... Um, of course we didn't do that. I'm gonna hook him up again. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why he just lost the. Actually, I don't know. Whatever. It's gonna take a little bit. <laughs> oh, goodness. How much part of the infrared LED? What were you guys using that for in one of the projects? Uh, we didn't, I don't know that we had an infrared LED. Um, um, we just had a regular red LED and an RGB LED. He's registered. Right. Yeah. I think oh. his battery's kaput. 
We charged his battery all night, but literally using the motor made him drop off the network. Sweet. No, I mean, it's all. Oh, did he come loose? No, that's not, that's not what happened. I mean, because he would at least be getting his messages over here. Oh, weak. Oh, God. That's, uh, that ain't me. <laughs>